first time here, Astro Tours, we host this every, almost every, the first Thursday of every month, um, were put on by graduate students in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Um, in addition to the talk today, afterwards we'll have refreshments on the 14th or the 15th floor of this building, actually. Um, you just have to go up the elevators once you can find them. Uh, and other activities on, in the lobby and upstairs, uh, including telescope viewing, viewing if it clears up a bit. Um, we also really value your feedback, so like we had last month, we'll have the tablet out, and if you fill out the feedback form or fill it out on your phone, we'll give you a cookie. So, <laughs> we incentivize. <laughs> So today we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Cameron Van Eck here to talk to us about galactic magnetism. Uh, Cameron is a research associate at the Dunlop Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. He completed his PhD at Radboud University in the Netherlands in 2017. He actually has some markers of his, or his bookmarks of his PhD and his PhD thesis here with him today. <laughs> well, lots of exciting things. Um, Cameron is the most dedicated participant at the department's sci-fi luncheons on Friday, and um, today his talk is titled... He knows it. There we go. Exploring the Magnetic Universe. So please welcome me and join Cameron. that are carrying my voice, those run off magnets. So there's a lot of technology in our lives 
that works off magnetism that we don't necessarily stop to appreciate. Right? And when we talk about magnetism in physics, we tend to end up with a lot of diagrams like this, talking about bar magnets and coils and drawing all these sort of funky lines around the things. What, what is it? What is a magnetic field? And that turned out to be a surprisingly hard question to find an answer for, fundamentally. And so the best definition I was able to find comes from Wikipedia. <laughs> the power of crowdsourcing. So, a magnetic field is a vector field that describes the magnetic influence of electric charges in relative motion and magnetized materials. What? <laughs> Let's try to break this down a little bit. So, a magnetic field is a vector field. So, a vector field is a mathematical tool that we like to use in physics when we're trying to create models of things. And so, vectors are a mathematical quantity, basically anything that has a direction associated with it. And so a classic example of this would be velocity. Whenever you're traveling somewhere, you are traveling in some direction. And so that's a vector quantity. In order to know where you're going, you need to know what direction you're going. Another classic example would be forces like gravity. Gravity is pointing down. And so that's, that has a direction associated. So anything in physics that has a direction, we model as a vector. There's a whole branch of mathematics that describes these things. A vector field is then something that has a vector for every position in, in space. It's spread out across the universe. And so examples of something like this would be things like if you consider the flow of water in a river or, or a stream. Every position in the stream, the water is flowing, it has some velocity in some direction. And you can model things like vortices, flow, all these things. Gravity is another good example. You know, we, we experience gravity pointing down, but if you go around to the other side of the planet, somewhere like Australia, they experience gravity in the opposite direction. <laughs> gravity is a vector field, probably like, like, like the one in the, the right here points towards the center of the Earth, and your orientation is all relative. Okay. So that, that's, sort of the magnet, that's sort of the mathematical model we like to use for magnetism. A magnetic field describes magnetic influence. This is circular, and ultimately this is unavoidable. Magnetism is one of the fundamental aspects of the universe. It can't be broken down in terms of other things. It's not made of particles or other kinds of like materials. It is fundamental. And so, to some degree, you can't escape this kind of circular definition. Magnetism is magnetism. We can't break it down simpler than that. We can only talk about where does it come from, what does it do? How does it interact with the rest of you know, the laws of physics? So, magnetic field is the magnetic influence on electric charges in motion. So this is describing now the forces that are produced by mag magnetic forces. And so, electric charges are things like electrons and protons in the atoms that we're made out of. And when you, when you start pushing those atoms around, or those charges, through a magnetic field, those particles experience forces and they get pushed around. The classic example of this is if you take a, a metal wire, which is you know, made, of, made of atoms, electrons and protons, and in metals, the electrons are somewhat free to move around. So you push a, a wire, metal wire, through a magnetic field, the magnetic forces then push the electrons around, they get pushed around the wire, boom, electricity. This is the fundamental principle of the electric generator, is to, is to use the power of magnetic forces to push the electrons to where you want them, effectively. The other classical example is if you create something like an electron beam, you can use the magnetic field to push it around into whatever kinds of motion you'd like. So magnetic fields act on electric charges. The other, the other thing they act on is magnetized materials. And this is probably where most people's minds go when they think about magnetism. The classic bar magnet, magnetized materials. And so magnetized materials produce magnetic fields, and they also react to magnetic fields. And so this, this is how you get sort of the classic elementary school behavior of pushing two magnets together, and they either attract or repel. These magnetized materials are both the source and the interaction uh, point. So when we describe magnetic fields in physics, there's sort of two key properties that we look at. Uh, the first is sort of the shape of it. So we, we take the, the vector field, like the ones I was showing, and we basically, you can connect all the vectors together to basically draw out shapes, the shape of the magnetic field. And so we tend to have these, these kinds of diagrams, which basically give us the topology of the magnetic field. And this, this is what gives us, tells us about behavior like attraction or repulsion. And this tends to get really messy to try and do in a general discussion, so I'm not going to go into those much more detail. The much more sort of accessible uh, statistic or property of magnetic fields is the magnetic field strength. This is effectively what determines the 
strength of the forces produced by a magnetic field. And so th these sort of can be stronger or weaker depending on the strength on the magnetic field. And just to give some frame of reference, our common everyday fridge magnet sits at about 50 Gauss. Gauss is the SI unit, or it's actually not the SI unit, it's, it's a non-SI unit for magnetic field strength. So that's not a particularly meaningful thing, but this is our frame of reference. 50 Gauss for a fridge magnet. Uh, something else, like for example, loudspeaker magnets are quite strong. They're at about 10,000 Gauss. And if you ever played with those little neodymium super strong magnets that you basically have to put all your muscles into pulling apart, those are also about 10,000 Gauss to their surface. So that's sort of a frame of reference there. Uh, if you've ever taken an MRI scanner, if you know someone who has, the M stands for magnetic. And in order to operate, an MRI machine has to have as powerful a magnetic field as possible. And so typical MRI machines are about 50,000 Gauss. And so this is the reason you do not bring metal anywhere near one. Bad things will happen. At sort of the other end of the scale, magnetic fields are also produced by anything that has sort of strong electricity flowing through it. So just household appliances like microwaves and toasters have their own little magnetic field around them. These are about sort of 5 to 50 milligauss, so about a thousand times weaker than a fridge magnet. And low power devices are even lower than that. So if anyone ever tells you that your cell phone is emitting dangerous magnetic fields, <laughs> thousands of thousands of times weaker than fridge magnets. <laughs> Nothing to do. <laughs> so what produces magnetism, physically speaking? So there are two key sources. The one I think that most people would immediately jump to is magnetic materials, magnets. So there's a couple of different forms this can take, paramagnetism and ferromagnetism. Just sort of di just different ways that different materials can react to uh, magnetic fields. This is actually not particularly common in astrophysics, and so we won't see this again. Surprisingly, the more common source of magnetism in the universe at large is electric currents. So electric currents produce magnetism if you take a wire, uh, run electricity through it, you can create a coil like this. The end result is a magnetic field around the wire. This is why household appliances have a magnetic field. And uh, the sort of typical application, at least in my mind, would be something like a very powerful electromagnet. If, you, if you've ever seen those big electromagnets that pick up cars, drop them in crushers, those are just really, really strong electric currents running on large coils to, to produce those kinds of magnetic fields. So, with the physics out of the way, let's start talking astronomy. So, magnetic fields are everywhere in the universe. So we can pick out a few sort of interesting systems. We're not going to go into space yet, let's start with the Earth. So the Earth, of course, has its own magnetic field, that's why compasses work, for example. Compass needles react to the Earth's magnetic field. And the Earth's magnetic field does a lot of really cool things. So uh, it extends quite far into space, tens of thousands of kilometers. And one of the beneficial things it does is it shields us from radiation from space. So uh, we know from before that magnetic fields affect electric charges. And so charged particles, such as charged radiation that comes off the sun in the form of the solar wind, it, it it's launches off the sun, flies through interplanetary space, reaches the Earth, gets affected by the Earth's magnetic field. Most of it basically gets deflected around, avoids the Earth, which is good for us. Some fraction of it ends up trapped in the Earth's magnetic field, and it gets funneled down towards the magnetic poles of the Earth. And the result of that, then, is the Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis at the southern pole, the northern and southern lines. And so these are, these are ultimately a magnetic phenomenon. Charged particle radiation traveling down the magnetic field until it hits the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere. And so a lot of the structure that we see, all these arcs and ripples, are reflective of structure in the magnetic field of the Earth. And so there's a lot of fascinating information here, a lot of dynamics. I know some of the people who study Aurora professionally, it's a really fascinating topic very active, a lot going on. And that teaches us a lot about the near-Earth space environment, what the magnetism is doing, what the radiation is doing, a lot of interesting physics involved in that. Uh, another topic, or another area in which the Earth's magnetic field acts up, surprisingly, is in biology. So birds and other species quite 
famously migrate north-south thousands of kilometers every year. And so, natural question to ask is, how do they navigate? And what keeps them pointed north or south? And according to the biologists, many species of birds have the ability to sense magnetic fields. They have a little compass in their heads pointing north, and that allows them to keep on track. That's really cool. Even weirder in biology, cows align with magnetic fields. This is an amazing study from 2006. This was great. So these, these guys did an amazing thing. They took Google Maps imagery, found pictures of cows and deer. I think the cows are great. I'm a farmer. I like cows. They found pictures of cows, and they measured the orientation. Which way are the cows standing? And they measured the shadows of the cows to figure out where the sun was. So they could ask questions like, are the cows, do they just naturally go perpendicular to the sun, to sun themselves? No, it turns out that cows naturally like to align north-south. But not geographically north-south. The Earth's magnetic pole is shifted a little bit from the geographic pole. And if you study northern enough cows, Canadian cows, you can tell the difference between geographic north and magnetic north. <laughs> and cows align with the magnetic north pole. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Biology is weird. But kudos to them for discovering this. This is amazing. This is amazing. So, uh, strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Now that I'm you know, having established reference values before, the Earth's magnetic field including the magnetic field in this room, we're sitting on the Earth after all, is about half a gauss. It is a hundred times weaker than a fridge magnet. And so this is the magnetic field that you have been sitting in your entire life. So it's completely harmless. Which is another reason why cell phone magnetic fields are not dangerous. So what is the physical cause then of the Earth's magnetic field? So we know from geology, that the Earth's core is a solid sphere of nickel iron. So the first you know, initial theory you might pose is, well, iron you know, can be magnetized. Big block of iron in the core, maybe it's just a permanent magnet. Sounds perfectly reasonable. Sadly, it doesn't work. Uh, the iron in the Earth's core is actually too hot to be a permanent magnet. Ma magnets demagnetize if you heat them up. So the cause of the Earth's magnetism is not the solid iron core. So what is it then? To get into that, we need to explore a rather obscure little corner of physics called magnetic dynamo theory, which is the part of physics that asks the question, how do you generate magnetic fields in different environments? And this is a subset of a part of physics called magnetohydrodynamics. It's a fun word. It's too long for Scott. Too bad. But it's a really, this is a really cool corner of physics, I think, at least. So magnetohydrodynamics is the study of the, the motion and behavior, the dynamics, of fluids, not just water, but any fluid in principle, liquids and gases. So it's the behavior of gases and fluids that are magnetically reactive, specifically. So what is a magnetically reactive fluid? There's two types. First is liquid metals. So, solid iron doesn't classify as not a fluid, but liquid materials, liquid metals, certainly can. And the second is ionized gas, namely plasma. This is gas where the atoms have had some of the electrons ripped or pulled off, and so the electrons and the now positively charged atoms are floating around separately, and they can react to electric and magnetic forces. And so these, two, these kinds of materials are highly electrically conductive. And that's what we need for a dynamo. And so magneto hydrodynamics tries to take all of the physics that can apply to these kinds of magnetically reactive fluids. You end up with a set of equations that looks kind of like this. This is math. There are three zeros in there. But the rest of this is also math. And so this set of equations encapsulate all the relevant physics. and includes things like Newton's laws of motion all the relevant forces like pressure, gravity, and such like. It includes all the, the mathematics behind how electric fields are generated, and magnetic fields, and what shapes they take. 
as well as how electric currents are generated and what they do and all the forces involved. So you encapsulate all of that physics in a set of equations and you try and solve it. And it turns out we can't. Or rather, let's put it this way, if you do manage to solve these, you'll become very, very famous. <laughs> And so instead, what we're left with is we can try to solve simple cases. There are a few simple kind of configurations that you can solve analytically and get actual equations out of the solution. And the more common thing is you can do computer simulations. Computers are amazing. And so you can come up with pretty good approximate solutions by using computer simulations these days. And so that's sort of our primary method of trying to explore the behavior of some of the more complicated systems that we want to try to understand. And in principle, in, in the dynamo theory part of magnetohydrodynamics, we really want to know how do you get a magnetic field out of the kinds of systems, the kind of magnetically reactive fluid systems that MHD is, is applicable for. And so how this works, the simplest form of a magnetic dynamo looks, my battery's dying, there we go, looks kind of like this. Start with a loop of fluid, some magnetically reactive fluid, put a magnetic field in it. Now take it and stretch it out like a rubber band and put a half twist in it. So just like you're trying to double up a rubber band, fold it back. So now you, what you have then is a doubled up loop. It's the same amount of fluid, but the magnetic field is now doubled up. It's gotten twice as strong as it was before. And so if you can repeat this, you can you know, quadruple the magnetic field, eight times 16, etc. This is the principle of a magnetic dynamo is boosting the magnetic field strength through some kind of motion of the fluid. And so the three ingredients that you then need to run a magnetic dynamo are some kind of cyclic motion. You need something that will repeat. If it just runs once and stops, the magnetic field will just decay. So it needs to repeat itself. You need the conductive fluid, because it needs to be able to sort of flow around, as well as conduct the, the electric currents involved. And it needs an initial magnetic field. And so this is now not the origin of the very first magnetic fields. And that's actually a really interesting active topic in astrophysics right now is trying to figure out what are the mechanisms of getting the very first magnetic fields in the universe. Very hot topic, very unsolved. But once we have those very first magnetic fields, we have a pretty good idea how to boost them up to the strength that we see in the modern universe. So let's go back to the Earth now. So as I said, we have this inner solid core. It's solid, it's iron, it can't uh, generate a magnetic field or hold one. But around that, we have this layer of molten iron. Molten iron, liquid metal, there we go. So that's our, that's our conductive fluid. So where's our cyclic motion? So the core of the Earth is quite hot, of course. The outer layer is sort of, you know, very nicely room temperature-ish. So we have a temperature gradient, and this is driving conduction. So hot material from down near the core will rise up, as hot material does, rises up, loses its heat near the surface, sinks back down. So you have a convective cycle. And you combine this with the rotation of the Earth, which gives you some spin, and you, can, you add to that the Coriolis forces that come out of the, the spin. So this is the effect that sort of makes tornadoes spin a particular direction in the northern hemisphere. So the Coriolis forces, the spin, and the convection work together. You get this sort of helical motion from the diagram. And this is enough to generate a magnetic field. And so as long as this process continues, the magnetic field of the Earth is sustained. And that works quite well. Uh, I want to make a small digression before moving on to other systems. Just talking about, I mentioned that we can do computer simulations and solve simple cases, but another way of tackling dynamo theory is experimental. And I, I attended a talk on this particular experiment a few years ago, and I thought it was too amazing not to share. So this is a dynamo experiment being done at the University of Maryland, where, where they are taking 13 tons of molten liquid sodium. That's their conductive fluid. Molten, you have to heat it up to melt it, because sodium is normally solid. That room temperature. Heat it up to melt it, 13 tons of liquid sodium, and you spin it in this spherical chamber at 50 times a second. 3,000 RPM, 13 tons of liquid sodium. And there's some coils at the bottom you might be able to see. So they power those up as an electromagnet, get some initial magnetic field going, have the system spin, and they measured, is the system generating a new magnetic field? Is it boosting it? What are the properties? Is it working? What happens?
is if you change some of the experimental settings, you know, they're doing a lot of really interesting experiments. But one of the interesting complicating factors that I follow up with is, does anyone know what happens to sodium when you put it in contact with water? Yeah. It goes boom. And so imagine, if you will, 13 tons of rapidly spinning, <laughs> super hot, molten sodium. Imagine, and this hasn't happened, imagine what if something went wrong? What if it got out? You know, set the lab on fire. Set off the sprinklers. Set off the sprinkler. <laughs> oh no. So in order, to, in order to get the permits to build this, they had to build a completely separate building in, a, in an empty corner of campus. A building with no water. No, no sprinklers, no toilets, nothing. No water anywhere near it. And they had to put in like halon gas fire suppression systems. And they had to promise to be very, very careful. <laughs> and it worked. So they, they have built it and it is doing amazing, amazing science. And so I thought that was really, really cool. But let's go to space. You know, we're 20 minutes in. Finally, there will be space. <laughs> let's talk about Jupiter. If you look at Jupiter, and particularly with an ultraviolet sensitive camera, Sometimes, you will see this. Doesn't that look an awful lot like aurora? And it turns out, yes, if you study it closely enough, that is in fact what it is. Jupiter has its own aurora, therefore it has its own magnetic field. We have other evidence, I just thought this was the prettiest. <laughs> and so, Jupiter has its own magnetic field, and it is crazy. So, it is huge to start with. Jupiter's magnetic field is hundreds of times bigger than Jupiter. It's big enough that if we could see magnetic fields, Jupiter's magnetic field would be bigger than the moon, for sure, and depending on the orientation and where it was in the orbit, it could be bigger than the Big Dipper. It stretches out that far. And one of the cool side effects of this is it actually extends past the moons around it. So the Earth's magnetic field doesn't actually reach our moon. It, it sort of terminates before that. Jupiter's goes way out past it, and so the magnetic field passes through the moons, interacts with it, stirs up a lot of trouble. And some of, the, some of the results of that is you get charged particles coming off of these moons as a result of various physical processes. Those charged particles, just like with the, the particles from the sun and the Earth's aurora, get funneled back down the magnetic field lines into the poles of Jupiter. And so in this diagram, you're seeing particles from the moons, and particularly you can see a few hot spots where it's particularly intense. If you took those hot spots and traced them along the magnetic field, it goes back to those moons. And so that is the source of those particles. And so that is an absolutely fascinating process, I think. Uh, in addition, the, uh, those particles as well, in addition to, to causing the aurora on Jupiter, also create radio emission. I am a radio astronomer, this is what gets me interested. So if you point a radio telescope at Jupiter, <coughs> and create some images, you get stuff like this. And these are three images at three different times. And it's very, there, there are clear differences between them. Jupiter's magnetic field, its magnetosphere, is very dynamic. There's a lot of activity going on, hot spots are forming, shape is changing, things are waving around. It's a very dynamic environment. And some really great data I managed to find online is this is a video made by the NASA's team who run, ran the Juno spacecraft, which flew near Jupiter. It had a radio, uh, radio telescope sensor on it, and it captured radio emission from Jupiter's magnetosphere, and then the team on Earth has sort of down-converted it and made it into a sound signal. So hopefully, once we get to that part of the video, it should, there we go. Jupiter FA. <laughs> and there is a lot of amazing physics in there. So we call, we call features like that Whistler modes in plasma physics. And there's a lot of interesting behavior you can learn about what's going on in terms of the plasma and the magnetic field and all the particles that are interacting in that region. There's just so much going on. That, that, that 
that particular sound effect in the animation was 13 hours of recording. And so there's all kinds of dynamic things going on, and there's a lot of physics that we're getting out of that. And yet, despite being so large, Jupiter's magnetic field is not actually that strong. It's only about four gauss, so it's about eight times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, and it's still ten times weaker than your lowly fridge magnet. <laughs> so I just, I just love that as a unit of reference. This is, I, can, I, can, I can feel this. Uh, so Jupiter is not the most impressively strong magnetic field. What if, what if we went bigger? What if we looked at the sun? And so the answer is yes, the sun is definitely magnetized. And so this is an image also produced by NASA. They took an image of the sun and with various measurements they were able to work out the magnetic field orientation and so they've traced out magnetic field lines through parts of the sun and hopefully it shows up well in the projector. But you can see there's all kinds of loops and arcs and arches. In some places, there's magnetic field lines going off into space. It's a really complicated, very tangled system, particularly in comparison with the Earth and Jupiter. And if you look at it up close, there's a lot of really amazing behavior involved in this. So this is, yeah, very up close on the surface of the sun. And what we're seeing here is very hot plasma at the surface of the sun being launched off the surface of the sun and then being trapped by magnetic field lines. And so these arcs that we're seeing are particles <coughs> trapped only allowed to move along a magnetic field line. And so very hot, sort of hundreds of thousands of degree particles, and they're tracing out the magnetic field lines for us. And in, in just an ordinary image like this, we can immediately see what is the shape of the magnetic field. And there's a lot of dynamics. These things tend to, to rise buoyantly and sink back down again. They're very dynamic uh, as well. And yet, despite all of this behavior, the sun's magnetic field is also not that strong. <laughs> One gauss. It's weaker than Jupiter. What's going on here? And if you're eagle eyed, you'll notice I've written under normal conditions. This is the sun's magnetic field under normal conditions. Things get a little bit weirder. How many of you have seen sunspots? Yeah, fair number of you. Good. So yeah, for those of you who haven't, uh, don't look at the sun directly, I'll say that in advance. Uh, but if you do look at the sun with the right precautions, uh, you will sometimes see dark spots on the surface of the sun passing through as the sun rotates. These are sunspots, and they're also the fault of the magnetic field. So what happens is this, the sun is like the Earth, it's convective, it's hotter at the core, and so hot material again rises up, reaches the surface of the sun, glows brightly, cools off, sinks back down, normally. Uh, under some, cir some circumstances, and I confess I don't actually know why this happens, I haven't dug into it too deeply. Uh, in some cases, the magnetic field becomes very, very concentrated in a small patch on the surface of the sun, and that magnetic field holds the material in place, it doesn't allow it to sink again. And so the material is sitting on the surface of the sun, radiating away heat, cooling, 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 going from yellow hot to red hot to black hot, and the magnetic field is just holding it there. And so that's what's produced as these, these darker patches on the surface of the sun. So eventually, these will dissipate away, the magnetic field will spread out again, and the material is allowed to sink down. This is on time scales of days to weeks. And sunspots are a little bit more impressive. They require a strong magnetic field. We're up about 3,000 gauss now. So we've finally surpassed the fridge magnet. <laughs> but not the loudspeaker. Progress, I suppose. And so what we can say is that the strongest magnetic field in the solar system may not be the sun. It might be the MRI machine downtown. <laughs> so, you know, astrophysics doesn't always win. So what causes the sun's magnetic field? So unsurprisingly, it is also a dynamo. So the entire sun is hot plasma, electrically conductive. There's our fluid. Uh, and it's all in motion. And so there's two types of motion that are relevant to, to generating magnetic fields in the sun. And so the first one, the top row, is the spin of the sun. So the sun is spinning, but not as a solid object. <coughs> The equator is spinning around faster than the poles it are. And so the net result of this is if you have a sort of north to south magnetic field, 
the, this differential rotation will drag out the magnetic field around the equator most, and the net result is it converts the north-south magnetic field into the circular magnetic field. At the same time, uh, I mentioned that the, this convection happening, there's, this is also subject to the same sort of Coriolis forces, sort of tornado effect, you need a twist, and that has the net effect of taking circular magnetic fields and converting it into north-south. So we have a cycle here. North-south becomes circular, circular becomes north-south. Feedback effect. Positive feedback, it builds up. And so that's the operation of the solar dynamo. Uh, so very briefly, I just want to talk about measuring so solar magnetism. Because there's some interesting astrophysics variables here. So in order to study things like the sun, we use a, a part of astronomy called spectroscopy, which is the study of the different colors of light coming off different objects. This is a spectrum of the sun going from red to purple. And what we see here is all these little dark bands. And these are caused by absorption of light by different kinds of atoms in the outer layers of the sun. Some of these are actually atmospheric, they're caused by the Earth's atmosphere as well. But a lot of these are from the sun. And so from this kind of measurement, we can learn what kind of atoms are in the upper layers of the sun. And so this, this is a very common technique in astronomy for looking at the composition of things. Because each uh, atom, each element, each element has its own sort of fingerprint in terms of these dark spectral lines. And so you, if you can identify the pattern of the lines, you can then say which atoms are present, how much, and sometimes even like what kind of conditions are they under, temperature, pressure, and such. One of the side benefits of these kinds of spectral lines is they're also, some of them are sensitive to magnetic fields. And so, if there's no magnetic field present, what you'll normally get in some atoms, like hydrogen for example, is you get a single line, and then you stick those hydrogen atoms in a magnetic field, and you get something called the Zeeman effect. The line splits, and instead of getting one absorption line, you get three, in the case of the hydrogen. Or in the case of something, there's a famous line of sodium. Sodium has two lines that are close together, called the sodium D doublet, they split into 10 different lines if there's a magnetic field present. And the spacing, how far they split, depends on the magnetic field strength. The stronger the magnetic field, the greater the split. So all you have to do, I say all, it's a tricky measurement, <laughs> is measure, look, look at the lines using spectroscopy, measure the separation, measure the split, and boom, you have a magnetic field strength for the surface of the sun. And it doesn't have to be the sun. You can do this with distant stars. So we can't resolve structure on a distant star. It's just a, it's a pinpoint dot. That's fine. You get the colors of it. Get the spectrum, find the lines, check the splitting. Boom, magnetic field estimate. And so we measured magnetic field strengths on thousands of other stars in our galaxy. And from that, we have a good sense that our sun is pretty normal, which is good. It would be a bit weird if we were troubling, if we were on a strange sun. And so in addition to uh, to these sort of direct measurements of the sun and direct measurements of other stars, uh, I mentioned earlier that we can use computers to simulate magnetohydrodynamic systems. And so this has become a very interesting little cottage industry in the corner of astronomy, is you can create these very detailed simulations of various kinds of stars. You can input the measurements that we have of things like mass, radius, composition, etc. And you can run these simulations to say, okay, how does the magnetic field behave? Does the dynamo run the way we think it does? And so this has become a really interesting tool to study uh, how dynamos, how magnetic fields in stars change if you do start to change some of the settings. You go to bigger stars, smaller stars. So there's a lot of really interesting work being done you know, purely on the computer side of things, effectively, and then matching that up to the observations. So that's normal stars. What about crazy stars? Surely there's a crazy magnetic <laughs> star out there. The answer is yes. So there's a subset of stars called neutron stars. Neutron stars are born in supernova explosions. So these are the, the end of the life of a very massive star. It's a very heavy star, and it runs out of fuel effectively. The outer layers explode outwards. The inner core, which can weigh a few times as much as the sun, collapses inward under its own weight. So you have as much mass as the sun or a bit more, and it collapses down, compacts, until it's about 30 kilometers across. 
Imagine that, a whole sun in 30 kilometers. And what it does is as it's doing that, all of that material is dragging its magnetic field with it. So you have an entire star's worth of magnetic field compressed down to 30 kilometers. All of that magnetic energy compacted down. And the net result? About 100 billion gauss. Finally, we have something we can be impressed by. <laughs> 100 billion. I left myself a lot of room at the top of the scale for a reason. And it gets even crazier than that in some cases. And for reasons that we don't yet know, there's a subset of neutron stars that have much more intense magnetic fields. And so we call them, somewhat un unimaginatively, magnetars. And they sit about 10,000 times stronger than that. So now we're up to about a quadrillion gauss. Don't take your credit card near one of those. <laughs> so, that is the top of the scale that we have discovered so far for magnetic field strength, about one quadrant. And there is some crazy physics here. So, you know, neutron stars are magnetic fields more intense than we found anywhere else in the universe, combined with gravity. This is, again, an entire sun's worth of mass, 30 kilometers, bordering on black hole status, basically. Like, Stars that are massive enough actually do become black holes. You could consider these failed black holes. Either. Gravity is intense, and you get some really bizarre phenomena, the most famous of which is the pulsar mechanism. So you have this crazy intense magnetic field, you know, in an environment where a star just exploded, a lot of radiation, a lot of charged particles. It leads to a, a sort of somewhat familiar process. Charged particles get funneled into the magnetic poles of a neutron star. And that's where it doesn't become so aurora-like. We, we don't know the physics of what goes on at the magnetic poles of a neutron star. But the end result is a blast of radio emission. So, radio astronomer, I had to bring this in again somewhere. So you get this, this, this very beamed directional uh, burst or, or continuous emission of radio energy. And quite often, the, as with the Earth, the magnetic north and south poles are not aligned with the rotational axis, the rotational poles of the object. And so in the case of pulsars, what you then get is this, this beam of radio energy spinning out, spinning around, and under some conditions at some times, it will align itself with the Earth and we see a brief burst of radio energy before it spins away, and then it comes back. And so you get these repetitive bursts of radio energy that you can detect. And so if you have a radio telescope pointed the right way, you end up with these kinds of signal. Very brief burst every so many seconds or milliseconds even. And these have been an absolutely amazing tool. So for many years, Pulsars, the sort of regular tick of a pulsar radio burst, was the most accurate clock known to man. There was a period where they used these to calibrate timing for telecommunications, because two different stations around the world could observe the same pulsar, synchronize to that, and know that they were insane. And then eventually, new generations of atomic clocks finally surpassed the stability of pulsars. And so we could turn the problem around. Using an ultra-stable atomic clock, we could measure tiny variations in the arrival time of pulses from a pulsar. And that unlocked a lot of really amazing physics, because now we are probing small effects in the environment of the pulsar. Things like if the pulsar is moving, that changes the arrival time of a pulse. We can measure that. Pulsars orbiting something, that is a honking strong signal measure that really easily. And you can get crazy effects. And so there was a Nobel Prize given for the discovery and analysis of what's called the double pulsar system. Two pulsars orbiting around each other, each producing these radio pulses that we can measure. And by looking at the timing of these and doing very careful measurements, we were able to study gravity under very extreme conditions, more extreme than we've ever been able to generate in the lab or in the solar system. And this has been fantastic for testing Einstein's theory of relativity, which is our best theory of gravity. And so by taking 
Einstein's predictions for what should happen if you take two extreme gravitationally compact objects, fly them around each other at very high speeds. You know, there's a lot of really weird effects that go on with space-time under these conditions, and those slightly change the timing of the pulsar emission. And we can measure that, and that has been our best test of gravity so far. And Einstein's theory has come out with flying colors. So that has been amazing. To, to the disappointment of some people who would love to discover new gravity uh, physics. But so far, no sign of that. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about my own favorite subject, which is magnetism in galaxies. And by this, I don't mean the combined magnetism of the 100 billion stars. That's also there, but that's not actually that big a deal. Um, no, this is magnetism caused by the empty places in the galaxy, all of the interstellar space. This is magnetism of the interstellar medium. So the interstellar medium is all of the gas and dust that is not bound to stars, it's not part of planets or asteroids or anything else, it's not, it's not gravitationally bound to a particular star, it's floating free between the stars, it's orbiting around the center of the galaxy with the stars, but it's separate. And for the most part, it looks kind of like this. <laughs> it's very thin, there's very little material there, and the only time you do notice, this, notice it is when it starts to clump up, you start getting amazing things, the various kinds of nebulae. So yes, places where it's starting to collapse to form new stars, places where old stars have like, recently exploded and not yet dissipated off into interstellar space. So that's, that's where we see it, but in all of the, the dark places in the galaxy, it's still there, and it carries a magnetic field. And so, what is that magnetic field? And so, this I think is one of the best examples we've had to date. This is a very typical spiral galaxy. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, Messier 851, as seen in the optical. And if we observe this with a radio telescope and extract the information on the magnetic field, what we get is a map which does not show up well on a projector. But uh, you can, at least to some degree, see there are vectors that have been laid on here. And these vectors trace out the magnetic field, and there's a lot of amazing information here. The, the magnetic field tends to fall into spiral patterns, like the spiral arms of the galaxy. And that's weird for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so that's really cool. There are places where it doesn't follow the spiral arms, and that's weird. There are places where the magnetic field is strong, even though there's no concentration of gas, no concentration of stars. What's up with that? We don't know yet. But it's really interesting, and it's the magnetic field here is coherent on scales of tens of thousands of light years. This is not just individual stars doing their own thing. This is an action on the scale of an entire galaxy. And if you look at, for example, an edge-on galaxy, this is, this is a spiral galaxy seen side-on. They're very skinny. And so here, again, you can kind of see there are the magnetic field vectors traced out, and it follows these kinds of arcs and it sticks out way beyond the disk of the galaxy. This is magnetic field being generated away from the stars in, in the thin disk. The magnetic field stretches out thousands of light years beyond that, above and below into the halo. And it has this very coherent pattern. We call this the X pattern in, in uh, galactic magnetism. It's a very sort of coherent thing on, on these huge scales. Uh, and yet, despite being uh, huge, and in my opinion, the most fascinating magnetic field, it is also the weakest. It's sitting at about 10 microgauss. So it's sitting about a million times weaker than the Earth, which I think is not surprising. This is empty space. I think this is amazing because, you know, the Earth's, the Earth's liquid core is trillions or more times denser than the interstellar medium. But the magnetic field is only a million times stronger. So, you know, the, the interstellar medium is really pulling its weight. <laughs> you know, it's really bizarrely impressive how strong the magnetism is in, in empty space. And so, unsurprisingly, there is a dynamo involved. And so, in this case, the fluid is the interstellar medium, the plasma. 
And the motion is, again, in two forms. So the galaxy itself is spinning, all the materials is orbiting around the center, and it's orbiting faster in the center, so it spins up. So if you have a magnetic field that starts off kind of in and out, it gets spun up, converted into a more circular magnetic field. At the same time, we don't actually have a, a convection process in the galaxy, but what we do have is material being launched outward by supernova explosions. Material being launched at thousands of kilometers per second, dragging magnetic fields with it up into the halo of the galaxy, and eventually the material cools off and starts to rain back down. We call it a galactic fountain. But in the meantime, it has dragged magnetic field with it, and because of the spin of the galaxy, there's a Coriolis force, we get a twist, and the net result is that circular magnetic fields get converted into in and out. Again, we have the cycle, circular to in and out, and vice versa. The cycle runs, the magnetic field amplifies, and it's been doing so for billions of years now. And so I can see I have reached my time limit. So I am going to uh, stop there. And I think, yeah, the takeaway message I'd like to have from this is everything in the universe is magnetized. And there is a lot of physical phenomena that this causes. A lot of really amazing stuff goes on only because the magnetic field is there. And uh, there's still a lot left to uh, find out. And there's a lot more I could say, but I am out of time. So we're just going to do the thing that we did last month again, just turn to the person sitting next to you, have a bit of a chat, ask them your question, and then we'll all return and ask them to Cameron, so we can have a little bit of a break.
elucidate the dark matter question at all? Is there any sort of interaction or there's no interaction or signal that we can pick up? It's a very interesting question. So yes, the question was, can magnetism give us any insight into dark matter? And the unfortunate answer is no. And this, this, is, this is sort of by our current definition of dark matter. And so what we do know or think we know about dark matter is it does not interact with normal matter through electric and magnetic forces. So dark matter can't have any electric charge, which means it's not, it can't produce electric currents, it can't generate magnetic fields, and it also can't be deflected <coughs> by magnetic fields. And so as, as I mentioned to the last question, there have been times that uh, magnetism has been seen as the culprit for dark matter, but that's been ruled out. And so we're kind of off in a little bit of a separate corner of astrophysics from all the dark matter discussions these days. In inverse magnetic dynamo, where is the energy coming from to fuel the, the magnetic disturbance? Ah, that's a very good question. So yes, where, what is the energy source for, for dynamos, in particular the Earth's case? And is there an electric current associated with it as well? And the electric current. So yes, there, there is an electric current associated with every dynamo. It tends to be Currents tend to be difficult to visualize. They tend, they tend to get very tangled very quickly. Uh, in terms of the energy source, the energy source is almost always the motion of the fluid. There's, there's a conversion of kinetic energy into magnetic energy through all of these processes. And so this is why it's important, for example, like in, in the galaxy, again, I'm diverting to my favorite topic, in the galaxy, the kinetic energy of the orbit is a thousand times stronger than the magnetic energy. Uh, and that's important because that is, that is effectively the fuel reservoir for energy in the magnetism. And so whenever the energy in the, in the magnetic field starts to get too strong, that tends to lead to damping out of the motion, sort of sucking off too much of the energy. The motion stops, the dynamo stops. And, it, and the field decays down until it's an equilibrium again. So every dynamo it's boosting the magnetic field, but then at some point it has a self-regulation process, a back reaction that damps out, keeps it in equilibrium. <coughs> Otherwise, the magnetic fields would suck up all the energy in existence, which would be a bit problematic. Thanks, Cameron. If you have any other questions, um, Cameron will be up here for a little while after. You're more than welcome to come and ask them to him. Or you can tweet them at us, and we'll bother Cameron tomorrow to answer them for you. Uh, you can come read his thesis. <laughs> um, so again, here's our feedback form, bit.ly.com slash app, or bit.ly slash astroturs. I also have the, I, the tablet here to fill them out. Uh, and again, we have activities downstairs, so just head down the stairs and go through the lobby and then up to the 14th, 15th floors for the telescopes. Um, and one last time, please join me in thanking Cameron for the talk tonight.